with destiny. This was their final hour. I think that we can do better in this Why country. Are you crazy? The fall will probably kill you. Everybody has three mortgages nowadays. In, no, we shall be your friend. Thanks for always being there, Doc. Thomas Jefferson survives. Welcome to Bromances of History. Friendships that change the world. I'm your host, Bo Hammond, and this is the first episode of a multi-part bromance of Abraham Lincoln and William Seward, and how they saved the Union uh, in the American Civil War. Now, I should say that it's not a complete uh, history of that conflict. I feel I should get that out of the way. And in this episode, I'll tell you uh, about an injured friend, origin stories, some background, and a showdown in Chicago. And as I tell you these stories about history-changing friends, I'll also be sipping a different type of whiskey each episode. And as a result, there is, on occasion, some profanity. You've been warned. Uh, For part one, I'll be uh, drinking Ryder's Tears. It's an excellent Irish whiskey. It's one of my favorites. I take it neat, no ice. Now, they did not pay me to say that. Not yet. Uh, This episode is brought to you by me, for now. Uh, normally, it would be my Washington, D.C. tour business or my corporate trainings and speaking engagements on Lincoln and leadership or drinking history. Uh, but all that, that all seems in the past. You see, it's the spring of 2020 right now. Um, because of COVID-19, I get the opportunity to tell y'all stories about great friendships full time. Uh, And I'd also like to thank some of the authors uh, that were essential in this episode, such as Doris Kearns Goodwin, Walter Starr, Michael Green. Uh, Their books and a list of many others I'd recommend are on bromancesofhistory.com. And there are a few things as enjoyable and worthwhile as friendship or history. And I've endeavored to combine both for you. Thanks for listening. Do I not destroy my enemy when I make him my friend? Abraham Lincoln. Fires had been set by retreating rebel forces. The former southern capital lay in a cloud of dust and smoke, and some city blocks of Richmond, Virginia still burned. Otherwise, I want you to imagine a perfect spring day uh, with sunlight reflecting off the James River, and onto the shore stepped a tall and tired leader. Abraham Lincoln. Now, at 6'4", he seemed a bit taller with that iconic hat of his, and by his side was his little boy, Tad. It was actually his son's birthday, and they were accompanied by only a handful of officers and 12 Navy guards. The city had been occupied by Union forces for roughly 48 hours. Bitter Confederates could be in any building or around any corner, and the city just could not be considered secure or safe. You know, as the party advanced through the streets, people couldn't help but recognize the president. You know, though they had never set eyes on him in their lives, his description was well known, and his likeness had been in every single newspaper. And now, uh, former slaves started to whisper, and then to point, and then to shout, and word spread quickly. The road soon filled with freed slaves, and uh, they surrounded the party. And some cheered, and others wept, uh, while others danced and celebrated. And for seeing for seeing Lincoln uh, in person, it made freedom real to them. Uh, and many simply wanted to touch him. And as the party made its way slowly, block by block, Lincoln shook many of their hands. And one older black gentleman, he actually took off his hat and he bowed to the president. And the president returned the gesture with cheers from the crowd. And then someone shouted, uh, quote, Jeff Davis did not wait to see his master, but he has come at last. Which, by the way, solid slave burn. Uh, Clearly, Lincoln was emotionally moved uh, by all of this. And then as the procession progressed, into the city, uh, I want you to think about the guard. So, you know, meanwhile, they're nervously eyeing every single window and rooftop. They're looking for an assassin or a sharpshooter uh, who could swing the hinge of history with a single shot. And one month earlier, 
Mr. Lincoln had taken the oath of office for the second time with a, a new capital dome gleaming behind him. The very dome that stands there today, crowned with the Statue of Freedom watching over the crowds. The president's high-pitched country twang carried across the people, uh, and his gray eyes were alight. As he described the causes of the war and how we had to come back together again as one people and one country. Of course, the cause of the Civil War was that peculiar institution and the terrible sin of American slavery. And as he recalled the beginnings of the conflict, he noted that, quote, both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. And a few yards behind Lincoln's left stood a smoldering John Wilkes Booth. He was there that day. Uh, and he despised Lincoln, uh, thought him a tyrant, especially for the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. But their rendezvous with destiny lay more than a month in the future. Uh, meanwhile, back in Richmond... You know, black Americans in blue uniforms had been among the first soldiers to liberate the city. And some of these troops had joined Lincoln's escort as it made its way uh, to the new Union headquarters. There was still a crowd surrounding them as the presidential party arrived at this three-story stately manor. And the president of the United States walked up these steps to the rebel White House and into the home of Jefferson Davis. Exhausted, Lincoln strode across the office floor and settled in an easy chair. And the eyes of all the Union officers in there, you know, they widened, they sparkled, as they watched Lincoln casually just sit in the chair of the Confederate president. They were witnessing history. They knew it. And they were in awe of such a surreal moment. And they waited for him to speak. You know, what would he say? And characteristically, characteristically uh, without seeming to know the significance of what he'd just done, uh, Lincoln looked up, with no hint of arrogance or gloating, and said, I wonder if I couldn't get a drink of water. Lincoln, uh, in regard to Southerners and rebels, had asked his generals to, quote, let them up easy. In the second inaugural address, he had promised, you know, with malice towards none, with charity for all. And he meant it. He wanted to bind up the nation's wounds and bring people back together again as quickly as possible. And let's just take a moment to consider what it took to get Lincoln to that former seat of power in the Confederate White House. The Civil War had raged for four years, from 1861 to 1865. It had been fought in hundreds of fields and rivers and uh, small towns. And I consider, I consider the conflict the darkest hour of the American Republic. The bloodiest days in the history of the country still bear the names like Shiloh and Fredericksburg, Antietam and Gettysburg. By the way, this accounting includes you know, storming the beaches of Normandy and 9-11. But this uh, was the age of you know, the steamboat and the railroad, of cavalry and cannon. Advances in weapons had made them more accurate and deadly, and this trend just continued all the way through the war. When Americans are only killing Americans, the lists of our dead lengthened very quickly. By the time peace had been achieved, uh, when the smoke had cleared and the battlefield sat silent, uh, but for carrion birds, the war had claimed uh, what I was taught in school is well over 620,000 dead. You know, but more recent scholarship, which I heard uh, from Ken Burns, uh, was recent scholarship had put that number at 750,000 dead. And this number does not include the maimed or the injured or the psychologically scarred. A staggering number. But if you were to have that same war today with the same proportion of losses, it would be the equivalent of five to six million dead. Everyone lost someone. And to compound this tragedy, uh, it was not simply north against south or blue versus gray but friends and families torn asunder by politics. You would literally have on the battlefield brother against brother or father against son or best friend against best friend. Uh, you know, how, how much harder is it to fight an enemy 
you have loved or still love. Uh, amazingly, through this bitterness and bloodshed, the union is preserved and the scourge of slavery is ended for all time. All at a great cost, as, as we shall see. The nation was completely transformed by the struggle. By its end, uh, the course of the next half century had been set. The industrial economy of the North roared while the South lay in ruin. The powers of the federal government had never been so vast and enlarged. We had the National Academy of Sciences that had been established. The seeds of westward expansion had been sown and uh, solidified in the approval of the Homestead Act, the land-grant colleges, the and by the way, certainly the Transcontinental Railroad. That had been improved by the Lincoln administration. But all this lay in the future, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but back in Richmond, Lincoln left the Confederate White House for a tour of the city. He wanted to see it. So he rode by the Virginia State Capitol building where the Confederate Congress had convened. The structure had been designed by Thomas Jefferson and is still used by the Virginia legislature to this day. And as Lincoln looked upon it, his eyes fell on the giant statue of George Washington next to it and surrounded at its base by these Revolutionary War heroes and uh, Virginia founding fathers. Lincoln had saved their bold experiment, for now at least. And after a brief time in Richmond, the president returned to Union headquarters at City Point on the James River. Uh, General Grant was still pursuing Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, and the end was close at hand. Lincoln kept in communication with the armies in the field, and he had gone from the stresses and intrigues of Washington. Uh, he had left all this behind for two weeks at this point, uh, which had done great for his own personal morale uh, and spirits. But while he was conferring with his generals and overseeing the last scenes of the war, he had left the day-to-day -day operations of the government in the hands of his best friend, Secretary of State William Henry Seward. And Seward sent word from D.C. that important work was piling up and, while not urgent, would require the president's attention. And he asked, you know, are you coming back soon or shall I come down to you? And Lincoln replied that if the issue could not wait two days to come on down. But the next important message from Washington was not from the Secretary of State, but from Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War. Now, Stanton, uh, he was, a if you can imagine, a bespectacled, like, indomitable short man. And, you know, he'd been already fretting over Lincoln's safety and urging him to return. And he now had another pressing reason uh, for recalling the president. Seward had been in a bad carriage accident. He had broken his arm and his jaw and sustained severe bruising. And remember this, you know, Seward's in his 60s and at the moment was considered in critical condition. And upon hearing the news, Lincoln, he wanted to return to the Capitol at once uh, to rush to his friend's side. Uh, but a second telegraph message quickly followed from Stanton, and that one put his heart at ease. Seward was in better condition than previously thought and should make a full recovery. By this time, Lincoln felt it was better to return to D.C. sooner rather than later. So by April 8, 1865, the president was steaming north by ship towards D.C. Mary Todd Lincoln had joined her husband and youngest son, along with a small party of others. And they arrive in Washington on the evening of April 9th. Uh, and after they... They are stepping ashore. They got into their carriage to go to the White House. And they noticed that there was a change in the city right away. As they drove down the streets, people were singing and they were marching. Uh, bonfires had been lit on every corner. And there were more American flags than usual. The crowds were all raising glasses and cheering uh, and celebrating. And the president, you know, asked a man walking down the dirt street, well, hey, what's going on? And of course, the man, he looks into the carriage to see who he's talking to, and his eyes widen. He realizes who it is. And he says, well, haven't you heard? Uh, General Lee has surrendered. It's over. Now, the war was not entirely over. It wasn't finished yet. But you just have to imagine the relief of the first family in hearing that. Even with this news, Lincoln's first stop was not to the White House or to the War Department. The first place the president went was the home of his injured friend. 
Seward lived on Lafayette Square, so on the north side of the White House. It was a stately home of three or four stories. Uh, and Lincoln and Seward had spent so much time there over the past four years that it had been nicknamed the clubhouse by some. Uh, and these men had been walking, you know, just think about it in your mind's eye. They, they walked back and forth a thousand times over, side by side, through Lafayette Square, uh, from the executive mansion to Seward's home less than a block away. You know, they would be laughing back and forth or discussing the issues of war and peace. Many evenings, the president would be sitting with Seward by the fireside, talking and telling stories late into the night. And I'm sure we, you know, I'm sure we all have that friend, you know, where you lose track of time uh, and you feel recharged after enjoying their company. And so it was with Lincoln and Seward. So we all can, uh, you know, we all know the 6'4 figure of Lincoln. His image is burned in the minds of many around the world. But what, I, what of Seward? How many folks can really picture him if I tell you, pull up Seward right now? So I, I found a, 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 a terrific primary source in the autobiography of Henry Adams, uh, which is worth looking at just for a moment. And if Henry Adams sounds familiar, that's because he is the great-grandson of President John Adams and the grandson of John Quincy Adams. And this distinguished family was close with Seward. In fact, Henry Adams' father would serve the Secretary of State as the ambassador to the court of St. James uh, in England. And Henry Adams describes Seward like this, a slouching, slender figure. A head like a wise macaw, a beaked nose, shaggy eyebrows, unorderly hair and clothes, hoarse voice, offhand manner, free talk, and perpetual cigar, unquote. And Adams goes on to say, quote, that uh, he noticed that Mr. Seward was never petty or personal. His talk was large. He generalized. He never seemed to pose for statesmanship. And finally, Adams noted that what was more unusual Almost singular and quite eccentric, he had some means unknown to other senators of producing the effect of unselfishness. End quote. Right, but I, uh, I digress. So back to that glorious night of celebrations. Lincoln was dropped off at Seward's home, you know, where inside he was greeted by Frederick Seward, the son. Was assist- he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, of the State. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Frederick, Assistant Secretary of State, and Fanny Seward, uh, the daughter. And so they both lead him upstairs. And the gas lights were dim and flickering as Lincoln stepped into his friend's room. And on the bed uh, was not that energetic, slender, cigar-smoking Seward. The Secretary of State uh, lay with his jaw and his arm fractured, his face, remember, bruised and darkened, his eyes and his eyes slowly opened uh, in the swollen face. And Seward whispers, You are back from Richmond then. Yes, replied Lincoln. And I think we are near the end at last. In four long and bitter years of war, both men had worked and struggled to bring this moment about. And Abraham Lincoln, he, he, uh, he lays on his stomach beside his friend on the bed. And he, he was you know, bringing him up to date, as you do with your best friend. He talked about Richmond and Grant and visiting a, a Union hospital down there where he shook hundreds of hands while comforting the wounded. And they spoke for a time, but Seward's injuries and his exhaustion got the better of him, and he drifted off to sleep. Lincoln, not wanting to wake his friend up, carefully and quietly gets up, and he leaves his friend to rest. And that was the last time uh, they would meet in this world. And of course, uh, of course, these men had not always been friends. Lincoln, uh, for his part, was born into relative poverty uh, in a literal log cabin. You know, he's expected to make a living toiling with the land as his father and his father's father had done, it was not expected uh, to have upward mobility from this life. And uh, from sources around the Lincolns, uh, they were poorer than usual. Uh, And Lincoln, at least Abraham, uh, he would dream of more. 
He was born on the frontier of Kentucky around the same time, by the way, as another future president, uh, Jefferson Davis. Uh, you know, one family would travel to the old Northwest to free land and free labor, first in Indiana and then eventually Illinois, and the other family, that they would head south, eventually ending up in Mississippi. And it just goes to show you that you don't choose uh, to be born as you are or who your parents are or where they take you in your youth. You know, I believe in your personal choices later on in determining your own destiny, but I sometimes wonder what would have happened had their roles been reversed. Uh, regardless, uh, history happened as it did, and it gives us our current course and story. And the reason Abraham Lincoln resonates with us so much today, or at least one of the reasons, is that he embodies the American promise, that he proves what's been called the right to rise, that if you work hard enough and have the right character, that the lowest amongst us can become the highest. And between you know, working for his father's land uh, and being rented out to neighboring homesteads, uh, the young Abraham had only, uh, he only had time for about one year of formal schooling in his youth. And I, I, look, I don't think I'm being clear enough here. I'm talking about a total of one year of schooling for his whole life. And it's not all at the same time. It's staggered, stop and go. And he learned the basics, uh, you know, the basics of writing, reading, and arithmetic. And that was enough. You know, the rest was self-taught. Through reading and listening to others, uh, he attained a real education. Books were his grand academy, and that is a constant that you will see in great figures throughout history. Lincoln would, you know, read almost anything he'd get his hands on. Some things weren't worth his time. Uh, Shakespeare was uh, one of his lifelong favorites. And sometimes he, I know this sounds like an old grandpa, but sometimes he would literally walk miles to a neighbor simply to borrow a book. Uh, truly, as Jefferson said a generation earlier, I cannot live without books. Uh, Lincoln's father, however, did not agree. You know, he frowned on his son's passion for reading and education and going to school, along with some others on the farming frontier. And Thomas Lincoln assumed that his son's reading habit was a sign of laziness. And there are some stories uh, that report that while he was generally a, a good man and an all right father, uh, that he did occasionally try to beat this habit, and, this habit of laziness out of his son. And, to, you know, this is shrouded in, in sort of the, the smoke of history. But some years later, I think this is telling of the relationship the son would not attend a deathbed of the father, even when the father requested it, nor would Abraham Lincoln go to the funeral of the father. And it's not hard to imagine a young, beardless, tall, lanky Lincoln, uh, you know, watching like a binary sunset, you know, wondering what fate had in store for him, knowing that he was meant for more. I mean, cue the theme music. And Lincoln did not, he didn't have an easy life nor did many on the frontier. He had lost his mother when he was just a boy. You know, his first love, Anne Rutledge, was taken from him uh, by disease when he was just in his 20s, leaving him crippled with depression, an affliction and disease that would he would wrestle with his entire life. And, you know, for a time, uh, for a time after Anne's death, it was said that Lincoln would weep when it rained because he could not stand the idea of it raining on her grave. And there is, a, by the way, there's an excellent book about this, about how his ongoing battles with depression helped shape his greatness. It's called Lincoln's Melancholy. Let me make sure I get the author right. It's by Joshua Wolf Schenk. Uh, Lincoln, he would, you know, he would escape the farming life in Illinois. You know, first as a boatman and as a grocery clerk, as a local postmaster, a surveyor, and finally, he had a dual career as a self-taught lawyer and politician. Springfield, Illinois, eventually became his home. It's where he met and married Mary Todd, uh, the daughter of a prominent Kentucky uh, planter and slave owner. And she, she was highly educated, and she was just as ambitious as she was educated. Uh, she was not very tall, 
And to her chagrin, Lincoln would on occasion introduce them by saying, well, here's the long and the short of it. Uh, throughout his, his legal career, uh, he would travel the state in the Eighth Circuit. He would take on whatever cases that he could. And he made an honorable reputation for himself, and he made friends wherever he went. Uh, friends, for instance, like Judge David Davis, uh, for who, for hundreds of cases, when he, when he could not preside, he named Lincoln to temporarily sit in his stead. Uh, by the election year of 1860, Lincoln was one of the most successful lawyers in Illinois. And before he was a lawyer, he was a politician. Uh, though he lost his first election, he became a prominent state leader in the Illinois legislature. And in fact, Lincoln uh, Lincoln was indispensable in making Springfield the state capital. Uh, as a, you know, also as an aside, he had some military experience. It was the Black Hawk War. It was a minor in Indian engagement. And he was elected captain by his men. Lincoln would later say that uh, it was this election of which he was most proud. Of course, he would also say that the most combat that they saw was blood drawn by mosquitoes. You know, for most of uh, for most of his life and political career, uh, he was a member of the Whig Party. It was of Henry Clay fame, and they were the inheritors in many ways of Hamilton's Federalists. Lincoln and the Whigs they believed in a national bank, internal improvements. Uh, internal improvements, by the way, are. You know, state and federal money for roads, bridges, canals, schools, railroads, public infrastructure. They believed in a high tariff. Uh, and for many Whigs, at least in the North and the West, uh, they believed in the limit, the limitation of the expansion of slavery into the territories. Uh, he fought hard for these policies at both the state and the national levels. While Lincoln cut his teeth uh, and earned his experience at the state level. By the year 1860, right before civil strife consumed us, he only had two years of national ex political experience. You know, Lincoln served just a, a sole term in Congress. I think it was from 1847 to 49. Uh, that's right before Seward would establish a decade-long career as a leader in Washington. While in Washington, D.C., Lincoln earned a reputation you know, as he did wherever he went, for honesty and humor and intelligence. He accomplished, though, little besides, uh, you know, advocating for the standard Whig programs. He opposed the popular Mexican-American War, which would open, he would open vast territories in the West for pioneers and settlers, but it would also open and extend the conflict of freedom versus slavery. And this conflict would really be characterized by the idea of free land, you know, homesteading, and free white labor against southern oligarchs and slave labor. And there would be this compromise. That you probably, some of y'all read this in your history books in school, the Compromise of 1850, that would prevent open battle over these and other issues for just a few short years. And the Compromise could not solve the deep issues uh, that they, it was caused by this original sin of America, slavery. You cannot just paper over this. And Lincoln, Lincoln was utterly discouraged by his one term in Congress. And to his mind, he'd you know he'd retired from the scene. He'd uh, after sort of much criticism and what became unpopular stances, he stepped back from politics to focus on his legal career. There were bills to pay. He didn't. Uh, he didn't want to return back to the state house. You know, he felt that he'd been there and done that. He and he felt also that higher or statewide office was beyond him. You know, at least, at least for the moment. Uh, as has been said, we cannot escape history, and events summoned him back. It was actually a fellow Illinoisan, Stephen Douglas, that brought about Lincoln's return to the political arena. And Douglas had known Abe for many years. At one point, he had actually been a suitor for Mary Todd, later Mary Todd Lincoln. And Senator Douglas, or the Little Giant as he was known, opened the vast territories of the West that had been protected and reserved for free labor to the slave interests of the South. And he accomplished all of this with a clever yet destructive policy. He named it popular sovereignty. Simply put, 
Don't declare the territories free or slave. Let the people who actually live there decide the issue for themselves. It's very seductive. Uh, Lincoln could not stand aside. He had to give battle to this idea. He believed that slavery was on the course to ultimate extinction, as the founders intended, that nothing uh, could be done about the Constitution It was constitutionally protected in the southern states. But to extend its reach and multiply its chains, that was madness. That was immoral. And and it will be remembered uh, that Lincoln was a politician. He was not perfect by any means. And we have to be careful to impose modern morals and beliefs on the past. He was not an abolitionist, believing in the full social and political equality of blacks in America. And this was a widespread view of the age. What was not widespread but growing was his belief that this bondage should be contained and eventually be made to fade away. You know, his North Star was the Declaration of Independence and that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was the birthright of the whole human family, slaves included. Lincoln would say that, you know, quote, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Douglas's popular sovereignty would lead to what is called bleeding Kansas. You see, to determine the fate of the Kansas-Nebraska territory, pro-slavery and free forces would move to the territories to attempt to swing the future states one way or the other. What ensued was a, a bloody prelude for what awaited the nation, north as well as south. And back then... State legislatures chose who would represent them in the United States Senate. And Lincoln, Lincoln campaigned hard for you know, Whigs throughout Illinois, and he let it be known that he was a candidate for U.S. Senator from Illinois in 1855. When the time came for selection, Lincoln commanded the largest block of support. Uh, it, was, it was not enough to attain victory. You see, there, there was a small, determined holdout of anti-Nebraska Democrats, you know, meaning that they were against popular sovereignty, uh, and, but they would never accept a Whig. And the, this faction, they were led by Lyman Trumbull and Norman Judd. Uh, when it was clear, after multiple ballots, that a deal was in the works to get a pro-Nebraska and, uh, as was known, a corrupt Democrat elected, Lincoln, he ordered all of his support to Lyman Trumbull. He sacrificed, I mean, he sacrificed himself for the larger cause. And Trumbull and Norman Judd and many others would not forget it. Even as Lincoln lost, you know, he won. He won friends and allies where before there had only been enemies. The Whigs, the Whigs were a divided in dying political party. By 1856, they had mostly been absorbed by this new Republican Party, which had unsuccessfully fielded their first presidential candidate that year. And this new political force was, uh, it was a fragile but expanding coalition. It was, you know, it was made up of old Whigs, anti-Nebraska Democrats, free soilers, German immigrants, and anti-immigrant know-nothings. Lincoln, Trumbull, and Judd would all join its ranks. As we shall see, uh, the divisions of the Democrats would grow as the Republican Party learned to organize more effectively as a national force. There was another shot to make Lincoln senator in 1858, and he took it. While he was a successful lawyer and a sharp mind, He had not held elected office in the better part of a decade. The little giant was his opponent, and many thought that Douglas would not only, uh, he was only going to win re-election, but he would go on to be the next president of the United States. The Republicans of Illinois all lined up behind Lincoln. Uh, He eventually got Douglas, or Judge Douglas as he would call him, to agree to seven debates across the state. The political duel of the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, would put uh, the prairie lawyer in the national spotlight. Uh, Many hours and 
you know, by the way, episodes could be spent on just these events. Suffice to say that the battle was hard fought. <laughs> the honest Abe would later say that uh, he didn't know anyone that lied quite as much as Judge Douglas. Uh, even though, uh, from a popular vote perspective, Lincoln, Lincoln received more votes than the little giant. But he would, do, he would lose uh, due to gerrymandered districts at the state house level. And Lincoln, Lincoln was devastated by this outcome, though he worked really hard not to show it in public. And he tried to support all those that felt the, the loss as much as he did, you know, all of his supporters that had worked so hard. Uh, in a moment, and this is one of the things that I love about history and the story of Lincoln, but in a moment of despondency, years earlier in 1856, Lincoln said, 22 years ago, Judge Douglas and I became acquainted. We were both young then, and even then, we were both ambitious. I, perhaps quite as much as he. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure. With him, it has been one of splendid success. <laughs> perhaps this story can give us all hope in our own lives because it, it it does for me. It just means that it's never too late. It's never too late in life to help or to heal or to achieve or to lead. And I, look, it was a long and difficult path for Lincoln. Not all paths to power and success are the same. And the difficulties can be quite different. Now, the year that Thomas Jefferson took his first oath of office as president in the backwater city of Washington, William Henry Seward was born in New York State. And the race of ambition for Seward would be one of astounding success. And perhaps uh, could not have been more different than Abraham Lincoln's path. In education, for instance, Seward had years of formal schooling, eventually uh, graduating with top honors from Union College in his native state. Uh, and instead of walking miles for a single book in his youth, entire libraries were at his disposal. Uh, you know, he was intelligent and articulate with an idealistic streak and great charisma to win allies to his cause. His wife, uh, Frances Seward, was an abolitionist who hated politics. She was an introvert. Uh, but she served as a, um, a moral motivator for her Henry, as she called him. She uh, shunned the spotlight while he shined in it. And like Lincoln, Seward made a career of both politics and the law. As a lawyer, he was inspirational and prosperous, even arguing before the Supreme Court uh, a number of times. Uh, as is the case in much of history, a crazy random happenstance changed the course of his life forever. A broken wagon wheel uh, led to the meeting of Seward and one Thurlow Weed. Uh, they became not only best friends, but one of the most powerful political partnerships of the age. Thurlow Weed was a, a newspaper man and a self-made political boss. He would be the campaign manager for all of Seward's runs from the beginning, you know, as a, from being a state senator to a two-term governor of New York uh, to a decade in the United States Senate. And Seward actually said, uh, he once said, quote, Seward is weed and weed is Seward. What I do, weed approves. What he says, I endorse. We are one. So, I mean, look, everyone knew that he would one day be president of the United States and Thurlow Weed would make it so. The policies they fought for as Whigs and then uh, as Republicans had a broad range, and Seward advocated for state and federal funds to unlock the potential of New York and the American people. Uh, he and Weed uh, advocated for what we've talked about earlier, that uh, you know internal improvements. And again, government support for roads, railways, canals, education. And the power and promise of education was not underestimated by Seward, who wanted all children in the state, including Catholic immigrants, to have a free education. And on the subject, he argued that it, quote, banishes 
uh, the distinctions. Old as time, of rich and poor, master and slave. It banishes ignorance and lays axe to the roots of crime, end quote. The forces of nativism and anti-immigration were inflamed by this stance, and the forces would organize into the Know-Nothing Party and would haunt and attack Seward right up to the convention in 1860. In politics, I, I think as in life, uh, it matters what you fight for and who you fight alongside. And equally important is how you treat those people. In the year 1838, Seward and Weed expanded their alliance to include Horace Greeley, a passionate political newcomer who ran the New York Tribune, which grew into a major Whig and then a Republican newspaper. And they would call this alliance a political firm. It was after the 1854 elections that Greeley terminated this firm, or alliance, in a letter to Weed, after all they had uh, fought for side by side in the political trenches. Weed would not give him a political office. And with ambition shattered, a friend became an enemy. In Seward's, uh, in Seward's long service and career, he made many friends and foes alike. Uh, this is, look, this is a fact difficult to avoid when seeking or wielding power. In his first major address as senator, he attacked the Compromise of 1850, uh, which was supposed to settle the issue of slavery for his lifetime. The measures of the Compromise uh, were many, uh, such as blocking slavery in the territories above the map line 3630 and a strengthened fugitive slave law. And without delving into all the details, Based on the concessions to the slave states, Seward denounced the compromise in a three-hour speech. At one point, he said that there was, quote, a higher law, look at this, a higher law than the Constitution. And this phrase would be long remembered by the South right up to the firing on Fort Sumter. And Seward was seen and perceived as a, a radical in many ways, he was a radical, though that would change during the tumult of the Civil War. In Auburn, New York, he made his own home, one of many in the network of the Underground Railroad that helped escaped slaves to freedom. In fact, as, as Walter Starr relates in his book, uh, Seward rented one of his properties to Harriet Tubman. And the Compromise of 1850 would undermine and divide the Whig Party. And eventually the, eventually, the Republican Party would take its place, of which Seward was one of the first and most prominent figures. In the 1850s were turbulent times, and the political landscape shifted, eventually dividing the Democratic Party. And the eye of this long storm was the slavery issue. Remember, in 1854, you had Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois introduce popular sovereignty. That was the first, one of the first steps in this decade. And this measure undid the limits put on slavery in the territories and opened the lid of Pandora's box. Bloodletting and near open war in the Kansas-Nebraska territory uh, was a result. In 1856, the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court added fuel to this growing fire. Far from settling the matter, the Tawny Court, in basic terms, said that black people had no rights, that slaves were protected property and could be taken anywhere in the country, including the territories. And across the country, pressure continued to build. And in 1858, Seward gave a major speech in which he stated that there was, quote, an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces. And it means that the United States must and will, sooner or later, become either entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation, end quote. And with these words, Seward infuriated the South and worried some conservative Republicans. Now, this is almost the exact message of Lincoln's House Divided speech of the same year. But Lincoln had not been... He'd been out of office for a decade and did not have the enemies or the baggage of Senator Seward. And the storm still gathered. And in 1859, John Brown, a violent fanatic, 
launched a raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. His goal was to seize the weapons, march south into the hills, and lead a slave revolt that would destroy this system in a race war. Federal forces uh, under Robert E. Lee responded, uh, and the ill-conceived operation failed. But the shockwaves sent forth gripped the South in fear and anger and further divided the country. The political landscape kept shifting, and the words irrepressible conflict echoed in many ears. And with tensions mounting, Weed urged Seward, hey, get out of Dodge, avoid this political maelstrom. So Weed, the plan was Weed would protect his frontrunner status and work behind the scenes to secure uh, the 1860 presidential nomination. Uh, as cover, Seward, I always, it just amazes me. Uh, as cover, Seward went on an eight-month grand tour of Europe to avoid attack and controversy. So while all of these pressures kept building, he was basically on an eight-month vacation. Meanwhile, Lincoln and his friends were hard at work in the West. The rail splitter had... Uh, had a he hadn't announced that he was running for the nomination in 1860. <clears throat> he had, however, uh, been offered a speaking opportunity in the East. And Lincoln accepted, and he traveled to New York in Seward's backyard to deliver the most important speech of his life up to that point, as at least according to the historian Harold Holzer. Uh, and he prepared for months, and at the Cooper Union Institute in New York City, he electrified the crowd. He impressed the politicos. And I just love how he ended his address there. Uh, he ended it with, quote, Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us, nor frightened from it by means of destructions to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. And in the cheering crowd was Horace Greeley. And while he was impressed, he would not support Lincoln at the convention. He was, however, on the war path against Seward. As uh, Michael S. Green, author of Lincoln uh, and the Election of 1860, wrote, uh, quote, uh, By early 1860, Greeley resolved to block Seward's nomination for the logical reason that he doubted his chances of victory and uh, also for personal reasons, that he would avenge earlier slights, outmaneuver weed, and possibly set himself up for political office, end quote. So uh, there were many you know, major political forces at work here, both personal and political. Uh, the Republican Party was still new, and his first presidential nominee, John C. Fremont, had gone down in defeat in 1856. The key states uh, which were lost but could turn the tide in 1860 were Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. And if the Republicans carried three of these four and held the previous line, the next president would be of this new party. And Stephen Douglas led a fracturing Democratic Party. Southerners would not support him and his popular sovereignty because that meant that slavery could technically be restricted. Uh, so Northern and Southern Democrats were splitting over the issue. And national politics were increasingly sectional. Uh, momentum and population uh, were on the side of this fragile coalition of the Republican Party. Now, this new alliance of know-nothings and immigrants, of uh, old Whigs and anti-Nebraska Democrats, if they could just hold together, then victory was theirs for the taking. They just had to nominate the right man. Seward was seen as uh, the front runner from the beginning. So the Republican National Committee wanted to have the convention on neutral ground. And there's no primaries in those days. And Norman Judd, uh, chairman of the Illinois Republicans, scored a historic victory by a single vote, his vote. Uh, and since Lincoln was considered a favorite son, but not a major contender by many, uh, Judd convinced the Republican leaders to have that fateful gathering in Chicago. 
It was then a relatively new city, about about 100,000 people. And there was a, uh, in the city, there was this two-story wooden structure to hold the convention. It was nicknamed the Wigwam. And imagine a building roughly, it was about like 180 feet by 100 feet, uh, with the purpose of holding 10,000 delegates and supporters. And quite a few of those people inside would decide the path of history. Now, Lincoln was both known uh, and respected, and many thought his name well-suited for vice president, a suggestion that Lincoln and his lieutenants refused to even consider. So he wasn't entirely a dark horse. I think there's a popular myth about that. Uh, besides, all right, Seward was the front runner, and uh, the rail splitter from Illinois was the second. The other major candidates, which really drew attention from other people, uh, were, uh, and there were other major contenders for this nomination. They were uh, a lawyer, I believe, and former congressman, Edward Bates. Uh, and then there was the distinguished uh, Salmon P. Chase of Ohio. By the way, that's another key state in this election. And going into the convention, Bates was the conservatives' favorite. He was backed by Horace Greeley. And the powerful uh, Blair family, Thurlow Weed, had blocked Greeley from joining the New York delegation and determined Greeley became part of the Oregon delegation. So he secured full access to the floor. Uh, he was both a newspaper leader and a full political operative with a grudge. Uh, Salmon P. Chase was a former governor and then senator from Ohio. So incredibly experienced. He was also a former Democrat turned uh, Republican founder. Chase represented the radical wing of the party. Uh, far more than Seward, I'd say. Well, many of Chase's beliefs were on the right side of history, make no mistake. He himself, and please pardon me, was an uptight asshole. Now, so much so that going into the convention, he had not even secured the full support of the Ohio delegation. Uh, he would forever be a rival of Seward and then Lincoln uh, with an ego, uh, like an ego the size of the Republic. None of these candidates would actually be there at the convention. Back in those days, it would have been seen as improper uh, for a candidate to crassly seek this nomination. So you were to wait at home and you were to wait upon the decision of the convention, and they would call on you to serve. And so we know that Lincoln was in Springfield. As for Bates, he was outside St. Louis in the border state of Missouri. Chase was uh, home in Illinois, uh, sorry, home in Ohio, I should say, uh, brooding, uh, I might imagine. And the man of the hour, William Henry Seward, was enjoying the company of friends and family in his large house and garden in Auburn, New York. Back in Chicago, both Lincoln and Seward uh, had their teams in place, working around the clock. As Doris Kearns Goodwin has written, uh, and I, God, I love her, and Team Arrivals is an excellent book, and she wrote, quote, Lincoln, like Seward, had developed a cadre of lifelong friends who were willing to do anything in their power to ensure his nomination. But unlike Seward, he had not made enemies or aroused envy along the way, end quote. Norman Judd uh, had not only secured home field advantage with Chicago, but had convinced the railroads to give discounted tickets to all who wanted to attend the festivities. So this made it easy for Lincoln men across the state uh, to crowd into the city. Also, uh, somehow, I don't know how, Fake credentials were printed out and handed to Lincoln supporters uh, so that they could pack the galleries and cheer for their favorite son. Chicago newspapers, right before and during the convention, ran glowing articles promoting Lincoln's candidacy. Of course, uh, even with all of this, most still expected Seward to prevail. And riding the rails, 2,000 Seward uh, New Yorkers and supporters with Thurlow Weed at their head arrived right before the convention. And he, uh, Weed was armed uh, with a massive war chest of money for favors and outright bribes. 
Uh, and uh, as described again in Team of Rivals, Seward supporters popped over 300 bottles of champagne the night before the balloting began. Victory for them and their candidate was assured. And this seemed, by the way, the opinion of many, even in the opposition. The point person for Lincoln and the deal maker on the ground was Judge David Davis. The strategy was to offend no one faction and become everyone else's second choice. So not only had Lincoln secured the whole delegation from Illinois, but secured the whole of the Indiana delegation as well. And both, remember, were necessary for the general election. And along with uh, additional scattered support, Davis had made sure of a strong showing on the first ballot, beyond simply that favorite son status that some other candidates enjoyed. And as Davis and his team worked sleepless hours to secure support uh, on the second ballot, instructions came from Lincoln. Basically, if pressed, tell folks that I agree with Seward on irrepressible conflict, but do not agree on, quote, higher law than the Constitution. And here comes the important part of that message. Lincoln wrote, quote, make no contracts that will bind me. Keep in mind, this was at a time when it was expected to trade cabinet posts and patronage jobs for political support. And many people were not above outright bribes. And remember, again, that war chest of Thurlow Weed. So when the the sweating 300-pound Davis received this message from Springfield, he looked at his team and he proclaimed, quote, Lincoln ain't here. And with that, Davis secured the swing state of Pennsylvania with all of its crucial delegates for Lincoln on the second ballot. That's important. We have no idea. Eh, we have no, eh, we have some idea, but we have no idea what deal was struck or what was promised exactly. But we do know that the morally casual and, yes, corrupt Simon Cameron uh, ended up in Lincoln's cabinet. So the Pennsylvania delegates would vote for Cameron, their favorite son, and then Cameron, uh, all those votes would then switch to the man from Illinois on the second ballot. That was the plan. And few things are as powerful in politics as momentum. So, you know, May 18th, 1860, the day of the balloting had arrived. Uh, the previous day, or the day before, the Republican platform had all been agreed upon. And in those days, the platforms were more important. They were taken more seriously uh, than they are today. And it pledged a lot of things. It pledged much. But most important of all was that slavery would not be extended into the territories. And Lincoln's supporters arrived early at the wigwam. And Seward's perhaps a little late due to, I imagine, hangovers. Uh, regardless, the atmosphere was electric inside the wooden structure. And... Uh, and the actual nominating of candidates. Of course, Seward's name was the first name to be put forth. The thunderous shouts and applause. And next, Norman Judd rose, and he put forward the name of the prairie lawyer of Illinois. And I swear, I mean, guys, the reaction was described as irrepressible. And wave after wave of louder cheers and chaos shook the wigwam. And I just wonder if Weed's stomach churned just a little bit when he heard it. You know, with a coordinated campaign team and home field advantage, Lincoln had the edge. Bates and Chase's names were warmly received, but Seward and Lincoln were in a league of their own. That was clear. Uh, Norman Judd, as chair of the Illinois Republicans and one of the chief organizers of the convention, had stacked the deck. He had stacked this deck without anyone noticing. You see, he had control of where the state delegations would be seated in the hall. He made sure that New York was hemmed in by solid Seward supporters, while all the, king, uh, all the key swing states were right beside Illinois. So when the deal-making and the persuading were most needed, Lincoln's team and allies would have full range of maneuver. The battlefield was set, and the armies arrayed. So the the votes, the votes necessary for nomination 
stood at 233. Remember, 233 at least to secure the nomination. The first ballot seemed to con, uh, confirm everyone's expectations. Though Bates' uh, Bates's team was surprised by Lincoln's strong showing and the Indiana support, which they had counted on. And on the first round, Seward received 173 and a half votes. That's just, just 60 shy of victory. Lincoln received 102 votes for second place. And now we'd began to worry. The second ballot would see many favorite Sun candidates be dropped. Where would their support go? That was a question in a lot of minds. And on the second ballot, Seward, uh, Seward's support increased to 184 and a half votes. Why they have half votes, I don't know. Uh, and victory would have seemed near. Lincoln, however, shot up to 181 votes. Pennsylvania had played its part. As had the Cooper Union address, New England support increased. And with this, there was chaos and confusion on the floor. Rumors ran rampant and deal-making was all hurried and momentum carried the delegates. So the third ballot, Seward actually lost support and garnered only 180 votes. Lincoln's total was announced to great cheers and fanfare for he got 231 and a half votes. And then a silence spread through the hall. Anyone keeping count realized right away he was one and a half votes short. I mean, holy shit, one and a half votes. That was it. Anything could happen on a fourth ballot. I can't emphasize this. Other deals might be made. Other candidates might come forth. So in this in this epic silence, the chair of the Ohio delegation stood up and shouted, quote, I rise, Mr. Chairman, to announce the change of four votes of Ohio from Mr. Chase to Mr. Lincoln. And the dam burst. I mean, never has there been such cheering and shouting and celebrating. It was like you and 10,000 friends had just won the Super Bowl, World Series, and the lottery combined. And then the dominoes started to fall, and rapidly. The delegation started switching all of their votes to Lincoln. Finally, crushed and demoralized, the New York delegation made the nomination unanimous. And according to Michael Green, that author I mentioned earlier, two men in particular wept that day. The first, Thurlow Weed, who had, you know, he had failed... Um, at a lifelong ambition to make his best friend president of the United States. And then there was Judge David Davis, who was, quote, overcome with joy and exhaustion and burst into tears. The Lincoln men had made their friend the nominee. And I imagine uh, that Horace Greeley must have rejoiced in his revenge. But back in Auburn, New York, a panicked, out-of-breath neighbor from the telegraph office arrived in Seward's garden where the candidate and some friends were seated, and the messenger, in despair, shouted before he even got up to the group, Oh, God, it is all gone, gone, gone. Abraham Lincoln has received the nomination. For just a moment, Seward's face drained of all color. To be continued. In the next episode, uh, the election, secession winter, an oath, and the storm breaks. I hope you've enjoyed this story as much as I've uh, enjoyed my writer's tears. Cheers, by the way. And thank you again to the authors of Team of Rivals, Seward, Lincoln's Indispensable Man, uh, Lincoln and the Election of 1860. Now, my favorite books I've come across in my research can be found on bromancesofhistory.com, or they will be. And a reminder that I am terrible at social media, uh, but you can reach me through my Patreon page, uh, or I game with people on Xbox if they're followers. Uh, a very special thanks to my friends uh, for their encouragement and ideas. Uh, as well as those that left reviews online like iTunes, Nate, Andy, The Benches, and others. Uh, you know who you are. I'm grateful. 
This is Bo, signing off.